So how long have you been out in California for? Uh, six years now. Okay. That's yeah. awesome. I've only been out there riding a couple times. Once with like a little training camp back in 2010, maybe uh, like super new cat three. And it was just, the riding was like mind blowing after being in our neck of the old woods, you know, yeah, Northeast. Yeah. So where were you in California? Like LA? No, we were actually just outside San Diego where we could oh. ride to Palomar and I'm yeah, trying yeah. to the name of the town, but this uh, it's, ccd cycling camp and a buddy that was kind of running our team knew the guy and it was six or seven days of riding and for me it was the first time i'd ever gone anywhere and biked like sure. learn how to ship a bike put your yeah. bike together so many skills in a week like you know, <laughs> you're four days in and you're like man I'm, you wake up and you're just like wow i'm gonna go ride 80 miles today like it just see it was a whole new it was so awesome whole new world yeah cool. brand new brand new experience yep. dude and that's this is like well i appreciate you sitting down to chat really it's uh these i forget exactly how these started but i was talking to grant coons and different people i just posted one with stephen bassett obviously your teammate and they've just been there's so much stuff that you guys forget or that you guys have gone through that can sort of help in an hour or so be a mentor to these newer cyclists to myself like i've learned so much from these and it's uh Steven actually was like, Hey man, can I go off on a tangent? Like there are things that you're going to think of that I'm not even thinking to ask. So like, just if you can kind of shed light on your training, the path that you've gone down, there's obviously going to be kids that are, were in your shoes that were like, I knew the Robin Carpenter from bike reg that like we rolled yeah. up and chatted before like cat skills and to see your meteoric rise to where you're at. And then also kind of putting into some context, like where you want to take this thing, where do you see yourself right now? I think we all know cycling's like coming from the States is different than being a cyclist in Europe, let's say. And you're where so many people not only would love to be, but we just have no idea what it's like to be there. And I think back to Charlie Zamastil had tweeted mm -hmm. Robin Carpenter, next big thing. And like everybody knew you had a lot of talent and stuff. I think you've taken things and there's has to be, and that'll be one of the questions, like what are some of the little things that you've done that you think have helped you get to that next level? Because where you're at, you know, I always tell like fours and fives, try to get to a one, two, three race. The competition gets much closer. Everyone's trying to find these little 1% where you're at and then where you're excelling at is like, it is amazing. Um, so just the little things that you can share are huge pearls for us all to learn from. And again, I just really appreciate you open up to, to talk about some of this stuff. Um, easiest question, introduce yourself. Who's Robin Carpenter? Yeah, let's see. Well, my name is Robin Carpenter. I live in California. I'm originally from Philadelphia. Uh, went to went to college just outside of Philadelphia. Met my uh, current wife there, um, and then we moved here. Uh, she's to to do a, a grad school, so she just finished her PhD, and I came here and uh, kind of just was a pro bike racer. Uh, that was like probably one year into one year after my first pro contract. And I've raced for only two teams since then, Hinn Cappy, uh, which kind of switched from a development team to a major force in U.S. cycling. Um, and then now uh, Rally Cycling, also known as uh, Rally UHC at one point. Uh, and yeah, been doing that for, for almost, almost a decade now. And you always seem to be on a super force of a team, whether we go way back, as I was saying, to amateur teams, bike rides, like you guys show up, it's like, you know, me being on Mount Bora and Nalgene, you were a team that your team was like one that we aspired to try and like be in the race with. And we're like, God, those guys just slay. And I mean, just hitters, but you also really raced well as a team. It was something really cool to race against you guys to see how you work together. And the, you know, it can be a funny team dynamic down there where everyone's trying to get theirs. So like you're on a team, but you're also trying to like get on it. And the more yeah. I saw you guys all winning was, I think, and maybe I'm just seeing it from an outsider's point of view, you all got yours because you all worked together to get it together. And it was just like you, Peter Hurst, Max Chorus. Um, I can't remember some of the other guys' names now, but it was just like, you show up, you better watch out. One of those five or six dudes is going to be crushing it. And it was really awesome. But so for people who don't know Robin, uh, real quick, you can look up all these results. I just picked a couple out of like your top tens are 
very numerous, uh, winning the stage at US Pro Challenge, Tour of Utah, GC at Tour of Alberta, uh, GC at Cascade, Green Jersey at Tour de Beauce, Winston-Salem uh, Cycling Classic win. And I think I'm going to ask you, what's the biggest result you're most proud of? I see Joe Martin GC is huge just because of the names that come before it. When you look back from where you're at now, what's the biggest win? Man, biggest win. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely like a couple, a couple different contexts, right? So like yeah. probably my biggest like breakout win was actually one that you wouldn't really see there because it wasn't um, UCI at the time, but I won the second stage of Joe Martin as my second year as a pro in 2013, mm -hmm. uh, totally out of the blue. Uh, it was my first year on Hincapie and uh, the race had just exploded and like it was total chaos and I think we put like four or five guys into this front group of 25 or so. And it's this big downhill sprint. And there was a huge lead out for, um, I can't remember, elbows with a uh, mark cut maybe. Um, we're doing a big lead out, but they went way too early. And then uh, we just came around them right around on the curb, got around super lucky before they closed the door. And then just, yeah, completely. It's like my second race with the team and just took out the, took out the stage win. And I was like, so that was like, that was insanely unexpected and really early in my career. Uh, but I think Alberta is probably, probably the biggest one for sure. It was like, it was super suspenseful. Um, it was against a, you know, a couple world tour teams who were really last day. And it was only, that's all yeah, good. Tour of Alberta for sure. It was so it was so tight on the last day. I didn't. Uh, I barely slept the night before the last stage. Like I was, I think I slept like five hours or something. I was up super early. First one at the uh, at the hotel buffet, just sitting there by myself, watching everybody filter in. <laughs> that, what, how did you feel about that? Like that's a were you like questioning like God? Why am I? Why did I not sleep more? Or are you sort of the kind of guy where it's like, well, that happened. Like here I am. I'm just gonna roll with it. Yeah, most likely. I mean, you definitely like stress about it a little bit. You're like, man, I wish I, I wish I wasn't like fully <laughs> freaking out right now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, got to take it and roll with it. It's fine. I mean, one day isn't going to kill you. It's not a grand tour. Yeah, well, one day won't kill you. They actually show that like within six hours of sleep, you get all your growth hormone and that even though some efforts might feel harder, you're actually going to have the watt. So it's like just mentally put, forget about it. Don't worry about it. Exactly. Um, Talking about Joe Martin, though, like you've always struck me as a dude that can get in on the nitty gritty end of a race, not only making it at the pointy end, but I think back to when you were fourth at Baton Kill, like that finish is pretty gnarly. It's got that last right hand turn. Everyone, you're full steam for I forget how many miles. So like yeah, yeah. set things up for that. You won that field sprint. What do you how do you describe yourself as a racer? If you had to pick just a couple words or maybe like it doesn't have to be a couple words, but how do you who's Robin Carpenter as a racer? Um, yeah, I always say that like I try to just be opportunistic. Um, I've never been the kind of guy who's just got like those insane, insane watts, like that huge engine. Uh like the thing that sets me apart is actually like more like a just <laughs> like everybody talks about watts per kilogram i'm more like watts per cda um for some reason i'm pretty arrow uh which makes it good in the breakaway and then like because i'm good in the breakaway you kind of have to be ready for any given day where uh like you can just sort of sense that the the race is maybe going to favor the break that day and that can be like at any point in the season at any race at any point in a race right it's like so you kind of have to tune yourself for consistency instead of, instead of super high performance. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think uh, opportunistic would be the, the right approach there. And that, I mean, that <laughs> I was like that bat and kill result. There's a lot of things that I can point to like early on in like 2010, 2011, 2012, um, where I just got sort of these key races at key moments um, and, and did quite well. And it's, sort of, and, almost by coincidence, it, it helped move me along towards the next step. Like I really count myself as being quite lucky and fortunate. Well, do you think it's lucky or do you think you're putting yourself in, you know, a good position to be lucky? It's, you know, if you want to go yeah, super, I mean, super micro definitely. on it, you could say because of the fact that you, you know, 
when people are like, Hey, I got boxed in. I'm like, no, man, you boxed yourself. in. like, you weren't thinking ahead. Like, you know, if you yeah. take it way back to each race, there's probably something that you learn from something else. And you're stacking these little micro wins on each other that then you're like, Oh, Hey, I just got really lucky. It's like, well, give yourself some credit for it too. No, for sure. I mean, you have to put in the work, you have to set yourself up for, to like take advantage of the luck. There's some phrase there that I'm going to misremember, but you know, the, the hard work puts you in, in a position to take advantage of the, of the lucky situations that, or the coincidental situations uh, that you might find yourself in. You know, I remember doing before um, that, that first year on bike ridge was bookended by two pretty solid results. The first one, actually I wasn't on bike ridge in bad and kill on that, that day I was racing for nobody. Um, essentially I was, I was essentially unattached. We won't go into that story too much. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're not here to slam anybody. <laughs> no, no. Um, but I was, uh, I was friends with Max um, from like Philly and the whole area down there. I think we had the, we had the same coach um, and getting that result actually put me like, I think I beat all the guys on bike ridge, including Max. And then he said, Hey, I'll try and get you on the team essentially. Um, and then at the end of the year, the last race, the Univest GP, um, which was, it was called Univest for a while, then it was called the Bucks County Classic, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I remember doing, like doing hill repeats, doing VO2 max repeats at, you know, in September when everybody's totally blown out uh, mm -hmm. and just really still training super hard for that. And then was able to, I think, take another top 10 result there. Um, so yeah, it's like definitely putting yourself in the, in the right position to take advantage of it. But yeah, like I said, it's a, uh, I think unless you are like super talent physiologically, you have to be able to be consistent and be ready to take advantage of situations when they pop up, when like that spidey sense comes up that everybody's, uh, you know, people aren't motivated on in this stage or what have you, then you have to be ready to take advantage and, and put in the work. Yeah, that's amazing to hear. And actually there have been from, so of other people like yourself, like Ashton Lambie, Stephen Bassett, you guys, high level people, these threads coming through of consistency, putting in the work, don't obsess over this watt per kilogram chart that is a one-off number. Oh, that, that chart. That chart, man, it misses people. That yeah. <laughs> and we're in this like FTP obsessed, like what's my number culture where you know, people would rather be able to do 300 watts for 20 minutes once, and they don't even know what they can do on the third or fourth time, as opposed to like 294 times. And I'm like, okay, are you here to beat the game on the screen? Or do you want to go do a bike race? And I was yeah. referencing to Steve and I were talking about it. And just I think it was either I, I have to look back now that I brought this up twice. Um, Johnny Brown, it's either an article about him, or he was talking about is it. like my watts, they're not crazy on paper it's just when it's four hours deep i can do some stuff and so like it's taking me to where i'm at and i just remember hearing that i mean like that that needs to be talked about more rather than just like what's my 20 minute best which build your ftp get stronger but like we obsess yeah. about the wrong metrics speaking of training what do you think are some small things that have had a big impact or said differently maybe things that we overlook that are little nuggets that you've picked up like man i wish i was doing that five years ago hmm. man that's a good question it's been a while <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a while of doing doing the same thing honestly well then um, let's let's scratch what's the same thing when you think of training you there's like uh yeah i don't know i think like at least for the races that i do the races that like rally does and that kind of stuff in europe it's the the main thing you have to just get good at is being able to go moderately hard for a really long time. Um, I think uh, one of my friends here put it nicely is like, you just have to like out sweet spot everybody else. And you know, sweet spot is like that type of training that's like definitely above tempo, but definitely also below threshold. It's got a wide range depending on how you want to define it, but mm -hmm. it's something like kind of like you just said, where it's not the, the 300 Watts, you know, one off, but it's, you know, maybe 5% below that, that you can repeat over and over again and continuously do for, for quite a long time. And so for the longest time, like my, I've gone through, I've had a couple of coaches in the last uh, six years. Um, and I'm currently actually like self-coached because 
um, there's just, <laughs> everything's just, there's only so much training I need to do, um, mm-hmm. different training, but I never did anything past sweet spot training for quite a long time. Realistically, I would, once we got really, really close to races, I would do a lot of, um, sort of micro intervals, uh, 30, mm-hmm. 30s, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, some, some amount of sprint training, but almost always what I was doing was just maxing out the volume on high tempo sweet spot training. Uh, and I think it's like, it's just a really easy way to, it's a, not an easy, I mean, it's really tough. Those <laughs> training rides are super hard. Um, super hard. Uh, but it's like, it's very efficient and also not high pressure. I think a lot of people go into VO2 workouts or threshold workouts um, with like a big number in mind. You know, they're, mm-hmm. I have to hit this number or I have to do better than the last time um, or else it's a failure. And I caught, I've caught myself doing that in the past, like really putting a lot of pressure on myself for these workouts that I viewed as significant or like some sort of measuring stick. Uh, and honestly, I think the things that have made me good and be able to be opportunistic and consistent, um, Mm -hmm. have been workouts where it's not about like maxing out that power. It's just about doing that sort of slightly lower amount just over and over again. Do you think that that applies to American racing? Cause you were talking about European racing. Do you think that that is also specific here? So if you've got Joey, who's a cat three or cat two, um, my one thing that I would worry about someone hearing that here is like, oh, I'm going to just, and actually another question is, do you think it's just the volume of work since, I mean, sweet spot, you can put out the most KJs, get all the work in. And so it is super efficient in that manner, but there's so many guys that like, they can't make the break or they can't, they have none of that top end. And I'm wondering, do you think you naturally have more of that? Therefore you don't have to train it as much. That's for sure. True. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> everybody hear that make sure everybody hear that caveat that was good. It's, a, it's a really good insight brendan uh like i definitely have a naturally high vo2 always have um, okay. i don't remember the last time i did like that yeah i think the last the actual vo2 lab test was probably when i was 17 so okay. you know, probably changed around a little bit with like weight and mm-hmm. you know more more top end training so mm-hmm. i definitely like naturally have a higher higher vo2 um and it's something that I do work on at some points, but yeah, I guess for, for shorter races where it's not just like this huge amount of um, volume that you have to get through, you, you, yeah, you can't focus solely just on the sweet spot, but I will say that it does, I feel like it does help you be consistent rather than doing a lot more of the training that's like sort of like lower zone two and then getting your intervals in. I think everybody could benefit from doing these rides where you are you know, pedaling on all the downhills, you're not sprinting up the uphills, Uh, you're doing like a real endurance ride, you're like maxing out, you know, your kilojoule accumulation over the course of this, over the course of this day. Like, yeah, I always get, I've gotten, (laughs) I've I've pissed a lot of people off on rides because I like to pedal on the downhills and I like to, like to go harder on the downhills sometimes than the, than the uphills. But uh, yeah, if you want (laughs) to, that's, talk about efficiency, that'll, that'll, yeah, that's um, I saw I've ever started like putting a warrant up that I'm like not paying people to say these things because, yeah. you know, a lot of times when I get a we'll, we'll help athletes out just like, hey, let's link them on WKL. Let me look through some of your rides, give you some tips and best of luck. And like a, the sure. most easiest thing to optimize for people is I'm like, hey, this endurance ride, how much do you think you coasted or didn't pedal? 40 percent and they're like no way i'm like well here's the follow da, da, da. and they go right and there. try and they do like 25 percent, and they're like i nailed it i'm like dude still a quarter of your ride is coached like you're not doing anything yeah. Yeah, so exactly. when people can get down to like 10 percent, and uh fausto was an athlete i'd coached who was a collegiate uh, i forget how you guys division these like d division two whatever uh time trial national champion and he texts me he's like dude i hate to say it i think it's that stupid no coast riding that like really <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah. pedaling for an hour in the TT was, is like nothing compared to pedaling for four hours straight. Yep. So it's these little things. And you had made the comment too of getting in the work. And, you know, there's, there's so much information on all these different intervals we have to do. And we do definitely put pressure on ourselves. And my own experience of training really hard for a long time has always been trying to pass on to people like, you know, someone gets in to week three of a training block the wheels are kind of coming off. They've just done two solid weeks, but like you got to be able to do three weeks. 
And they're like, I failed. I'm horrible. What's going on? Last week, I was so good. And I'm like, well, last week, you were so good because you were in week two. Then you went and rode eight hours this weekend. And now you're asking yourself to go really freaking hard again. Like, you just might not have it. That doesn't mean you're bad. It no, is no. time to rest. Soak it up. Like, now you're going to yeah. rest and get stronger. And then come back and we do it again. And we keep building. And like, this is the season over season gains that you can make. But it yeah. is. It's tough. I think especially when we're staring at the trees, we're looking at the workout. This is what I'm supposed to be able to do. I mean, even yeah. myself, I'll message Patrick sometimes and be like, dude, what is, I feel I'm not feeling good about riding. And you almost need that. That's why I've, I've always had a coach just to be like, okay, look, X, Y, and Z, this is what you did. Da, da, da. And it's like, why didn't I see that myself? But it can be hard. And I think it's good for people to hear someone like you saying that, like, it's not always executing every interval every day it just we it's not i don't think it's possible you can't do that yeah uh, or you're just gonna you're gonna wear yourself out uh, yeah. uh, mentally and it's a it's a tough sport anyway Super and i will say going back to that real quick about coaching i mentioned that i'm i'm coaching myself right now yeah. um for the most part but i don't not coaching at all uh it depends heavily on like the kind of person you are um and like how much you can you can self motivate and how much you uh, sort of trust yourself to mm -hmm. to know yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and ironically, one of the reasons why I did move to like a sort of a more of a self coaching platform was because <laughs> racing in Europe the season's so long that I would I would be I'd, I'd have training camp in the second week of January, and I'd be racing, you know, except for like maybe the month of July, uh, pretty much nonstop until midway through October. And at that point, you know, you take a month off or four weeks or three weeks off and you've got a month and a half to actually train at all. And at that point, it's mostly just base and, you know, zone three. And I was like, well, I don't need to do that. And then all of a sudden, boom, pandemic hits and I have to do more, more self-motivated, more self-directed like training than I ever have in my life. <laughs> it's quite ironic, but I think it's it's gone, gone reasonably well, despite that. <laughs> good, good. We can make plans, but we never know what's going to happen in the world. And I think, yeah, yeah it's, it's funny talking about coaches, like with me and Patrick, I actually just hired a new coach, Tom Bell from the UK. Um, I talked back and forth with him online on a bunch of different things and just kind of liked his outlook. And for me, it was, I wanted to have a new viewpoint, a new set of eyes. I also think in just some of the things he was talking to me about, he knew more than I did. And I'm like, man, I can learn a lot from you. I'm like, I think that you should coach me for this year and just see what happens. And I think sometimes people are like, they think they're getting married. Like, I don't know if I really want to do this. I'm like, dude, it's not from like a business side. We have, there's no contract. Like, dude, you can come try it out, like jump in. And after three months, you're like, this sucks. See you later. Like, um, my feelings don't get hurt like it's not for everybody yeah um, but that is i think the biggest thing most people you know they like having the accountability and someone to be able to help them see the forest when they're in there banging out these workouts and yeah. Yeah. also though to like you said to pull back and be like dude you only have to go hard a couple times a week like go get yeah. the volume in go do the work and i think just having that right hand man or woman is a good thing mm -hmm. um what do you think are some good habits that you've picked up along the down the road that's helped you progress? And how old are you right now? I'm 28. So you're still 29 this year. In the in the world, so you're tipping towards the older scale of pro cyclists, but in the world, still young and healthy. So you might not, you don't have like weird <laughs> kinks and everything. I was laughing with Stephen about like once I turn 35, dude, things change. And when when people used to tell me that when I was coming up and cycling, like wait till you get to be 40, I'm like whatever, old man. And now I'm like, oh yeah, all those things. Okay, extra foam rolling time, extra stretching, glute activation. Are there yeah. any little habits or things that you've picked up that you're like, I gotta do this? And it could even be something like nutrition wise or sleep wise or just little. I'm actually gonna say, yeah, sleep majorly important. Um, okay. I mean, I'm, I've always kind of been the person who's I'm like an oversleeper, maybe. I guess like <laughs> yeah, I'm the one who's always getting up thing? late. I think sleep, um, like just sleep yeah i don't know like i've definitely always been the one the, like the last one awake but i will say that especially given the amount that i travel and like you, you know travel is necessary for almost all all bike racing endeavors um especially if you're trying to like grow but the trying to like i have i have three i have three things that i keep with me whenever i leave my house <laughs> i have always have like a, a sleep mask 
always have earplugs. I always have like a small bottle of like really small dose melatonin. Um, I don't use the melatonin. Like I try to use it sparingly because like there's, you know, not a ton of research as to, or the, the, any the limited research about chronic use of that is not good, but it is, uh, it's really good for getting over jet lag and adapting to, to time zone change. Okay. And if you can get yourself used to sleeping with earplugs and eye mask, you can sleep basically anywhere. And I feel like one of the things that can hold you back when you've like traveled somewhere for a big race, you're staying in like a host house or maybe a, a crappier mm -hmm. hotel or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you're there for a couple nights and your and your rest is suffering, then it actually makes like a huge difference um, to be able to get some proper rest in unfamiliar places. And I'm not I'm like not a I don't know I can I can be like a light sleeper sometimes or just have a hard time falling asleep if like the you know it's kind of noisy out or if there's some light and if you just like have these things with you all the time it's just you you know like you can feel like good about being able to get the rest um and you know i think everybody discounts everybody wants to talk about watts and kjs and hours and whatnot but to be able to do that over and over again you have to rest that's the somebody had said that like the the best recovery tool for 2021 sleeping <laughs> it's like yes exactly yeah exactly that's so okay you're you know traveling you're getting in a new place you're getting you've got your sleep mask you're getting into everything you've got a big race what's your mindset as to and maybe this changes as you become a pro and it's more your job now and second nature but are you thinking of the race itself are you thinking of how your team's going to race and like your strengths and weaknesses of your team are you do you think of your competitors and who like if you're the GC guy, who you're going up against, what do you like, what's your brain thinking? Or maybe for you, it's still just like going to bed, got a bike race tomorrow. Are you, how do you approach that? I will that? say it's changed. It's changed once I started racing almost exclusively in Europe. So when I signed for rally and we just like mostly just went over to Europe and did that primarily, um, it got, it was a little different. In the US, I was much more able to influence the outcome of events in a race. And so like, the individual decisions I made ended up being influential on a macro level. And I will say in most of the European races, I'm getting my ass handed to me <laughs> on a regular basis. So it's about like more about surviving. And at that point, there's only so much that, uh, that you know, any sort of decision you make has a, has a big outcome on events. So there's a, kind of less pressure in that, in that sense. I mean, there's a lot of pressure because it's going to be super hard. Um, and you might just get totally, totally dropped or whatever um, at some points in the race. But uh, it is a little bit easier because you know that you don't have to, you just have to go and like try to stay <laughs> and get to the point where you can, where you can influence the outcome of events maybe. But it's not like in US racing where I was like, I could have a plan and execute the plan to a T no matter what, essentially. And so do you think you've had your most surprising successes when you don't have that self-imposed pressure, like circling back all the way to Joe Martin, your first year as a pro, and you're like, holy crap, I just won this stage. You're going in with no mindset of like, okay, I'm going to win. I'm going to, you know, Eric Marcotte, you're going down. But it's <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I'd say so for the most part. It's, yeah, uh, there's definitely, it's definitely easy to overthink things um, and not like, I mean, I don't know. It's also, like I said, there's, or like we talked about before, there's like a kind of privilege in being, having like a natural talent as something. Um, and so I think one of, one of my other natural talents is just being like pretty instinctual and like having a feel for what's going on around me, being mm -hmm. able to take in a lot of different data and sort of synthesize like the overall feel of this race and to understand like what is about to happen or what, what might be about to happen given everything that I've just seen. Um, yes. And I know that I'm fairly good at that because I'll go someplace where the race, the racing is like absolutely wacky. Um, for, for the best example I have of that is Portugal. Okay. Um, the, the kind of like the way that they race there and the, what they value outside of even results, you know, like is just so different from a lot of other countries and especially the U S it's, a uh, like the only thing that matters and this is also goes somewhat in Spain too, 
but it's like incredibly so in Portugal is like, can you climb? Like, are you going to attack as hard as you can at the bottom of this huge hill? Uh, and it just, some of it doesn't make any sense because it has nothing to do with the results. And it's just about like, you know, sort of the art form or the machismo or the, yeah. the, the, the poetry of, of like old style bike racing. Um, and I struggled in Portugal for the first couple of times I raced there. Cause I was like, I have no idea what's going on. Like I have no <laughs> idea what to expect. Like these guys are totally like, one, they're like really strong, obviously, but then there's just the script is just completely like upside down. You have no idea who's going to do what, when. It could be 10 Ks into the race and someone decided that they're going to blow it up on this hill for no good reason. And then also, you know, ride hard for 20 minutes and then quit. <laughs> just Dude, yeah. that's so interesting. And now you're making me rethink. So I did this Grand Fondo outside of... Uh... I always forget the city. I want to say Versailles. It's not that. It was outside of Paris. Um, and it was the UCI Grand Fondo Championship. So people from all over the world come out to this thing. I went with a, I was there. Another guy from the US went. And uh, I got in this break early on. There were a couple of dudes that were absolutely throttling it. Like I was yep. redlining. I'm like, yo, you guys realize we got 80 miles to go. Like we're in yeah. Boom, they just like rode themselves out of the break. And I was like, what was that dude's deal? Like a dude from Belgium, a dude from Germany, maybe. But like maybe that was the thing. They're like, I'm in the break and I'm pushing this, but like they were not riding for the win because they were I was like, where did they go? Oh, they're way back there. Okay, see you later. But it was it's like that's interesting. I never really thought about that. And I think that when you mention there's a lot of like mindset things, and like you're clearly using this thing a lot to find success, reading the race. And this might even be hard to verbalize, but like when you're synthesizing different things happening in the race and getting the flow of the race, I think this is something that's really hard to teach. And it's a lot of just you, I would wonder, do you think you picked it up from just racing a lot? And I always try, someone had messaged me, hey, there's this training race in February. I'm like, yes, go. I don't even care where to go. Like it's a cat four. They don't know anything, but they're strong. And I'm like, you yeah. just need to understand this dance that's going to happen because you're going to go out and think it's like gun goes off and go hard. And that's just not going to get you the W's. Is it just experience or is there anything else? Was there someone that helped you understand how to feel the flow? Because that is a thing. And I've gone back, Justin Williams, he was on a podcast and he was like, oh, wait, like, just so we're all clear, like Watts is half of it. And then there's that thing called bike racing that we have to do. That's the other half. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think? How would you explain that to somebody? I will say, let's see. One of the things I'm best at is getting into the early break when it's like going ham in the beginning of a race. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have kind of like always been pretty good at that. But one of the people that actually helped me sort of understand that you can't, you gotta like, use your brain was uh, one of my old teammates on Hincapie, Oscar Clark. Probably no one knows who Oscar is because um, he was, you know, out of the spotlight for the most part and was kind of the, the team captain. Um, but one of the best pieces of advice he gave me, especially for these like American races is don't do anything in the first like five minutes, just sit back and watch. You don't need to be like, a lot of people have this idea where it's like, Oh, going with attacks, going with attacks. I'm always following this attack. Like this guy's accelerating. Yeah, I got to sprint and stay on his wheel. Like this is so cool. Uh, I'm I'm at the front of the bike race, but you'll be doing that, and then the guy next to you, like deep in the in the peloton, is just coasting, not doing anything. And you can just sit there and you can watch and you can look around and see which teams are doing what and who looks motivated. And he said, you just wait. You wait until that break looks like it's formed and it's got ten seconds. And then you do a full gas sprint as hard as you can, get a huge head of steam on guys when everybody thinks that it's over and pop, you're going across immediately. Mm -hmm. And you only had to go once, you had to go really hard once and make that bridge, but you just waited and you looked around and committed to, to, the, one, to the one move. And it just like, that piece of advice just made me realize that you have to, you can't just like, be busy about it you have to be intentional and look around and actually think and like try to take in all the data um but yeah going back to that like yeah i don't know it's like i said earlier the synthesis of all the information like trying to 
like I'm the I'm the guy on the team who's always I mean, it's a lot easier now with all the apps and whatnot to to recon like a course electronically or, you know, I think VeloView or something that all these teams use now uh, gives you all the gradients. It's like a 3D model. You can see all this, like a, the profile beforehand. But I was, the, before that existed, I was the guy who was always, you know, on Strava trying to find these random segments to look at what the grade, how the grade changes, um, where this turn is, what the, what the wind direction is like. Like I definitely had a head had a had like a knack for for looking at all the details beforehand to try to set myself up as best as possible and it's kind of like a cool thing for it's like a, a vibe that some people have where it's like nah, i don't really care like i'm good enough to just like figure this out like and just do it when i do it and not really have any of this like information uh beforehand but i've definitely always been the guy who's nerding out on all of the details and trying to to know exactly what's coming up next it ties back into the whole thing of like, you know, not being obsessed and looking and, and ranking yourself in your head based on your watts per kg or how many watts you have, because I've never really thought about it in this context, but being somebody else in an amateur race is like, I like to animate and try to get into an early break. It's not that I have a crazy, I suck at going hard. It's just trying to go hard for those couple <laughs> times at the right time and getting myself into the group and be like, okay, I'm here. Like I made it. And it is, it's really that patience is hard too when you start to like go outside your local swimming pool and now you're racing instead of 30 guys you're racing 80 guys and that first I think that first like travel race you're like there's so many people here like what's going and it's like your head's spinning a little bit yeah, oh yeah for sure using the experience to learn how to slow that down and really start seeing how things unfold I think that is a really good comment that he gave you of just wait five minutes and watch. Cause I think back to certain races where I was really patient. I'm like, that's probably how it happened. Like it was just that one, you lit that match and got in the group. And then it's like, Oh man, the race just went from 80 to 15 of us. Like, okay, let's see what we can do now. Yeah. What's, what's a, uh, and you may or may not want to like put this out into the internet, but what's your biggest goal as a pro cyclist? What's your number one thing that you strive for? Well, long, I, longevity for sure is one thing, like trying to just be in the sport, you know, it's, uh, I've always said that it's just like a, it's an insane privilege to be able to make a living doing this. Um, and that, you know, prestige of racing and like the level of races aside, I think it is just, it's just an insane privilege to be able to do this and make a living doing this. And yeah <laughs> it's it's like so uncommon and so lucky uh i've you know i didn't uh, i wasn't like an insane talent when i was a kid um like compared to some of these other guys that i grew up racing with like nate brown lawson craddock um these guys who were in the world tour for a really long time and also like we're on the like the junior national team, the 23 national team, like straight away, always going to Europe. You know, it was just like in the cards for them from the get go. For me, I didn't even go to Europe to race the national team until I was my last year, U23. Mm. Um, so the whole like world tour prospect wasn't always there for me. It was like kind of more on the on the fringes of maybe being possible. And like I said, I also don't have like the crazy watts per kilo that everybody looks for now. Um, mm. I have like, like I said, an opportunistic and like a brain. Um, so I, for a little while, I had this like goal of trying to make it to the world tour, but I kind of have settled back into this idea that mostly I'm just happy to be here making a living doing this. And at this point, like, you know, it's been a long, it's been long enough where like I have a lot of expertise and like, I'd like to just sort of continue to be able to use those and uh, use everything, all this knowledge that I've gained. Um, in more of a micro sense, I still haven't, I have won, I won a race once in Europe back in 2013. It was a pro Kermes, like a contract only Kermes in Belgium. Okay. Uh, not many folks have done that, but that was like a really long time ago. And so like, I still have this, since I moved to rally, I still have this goal of winning like a, winning one of these races in Europe. Um, and I've come quite close over the last couple of years, but have screwed it up in a couple of different ways. Is that, uh, Norway, <laughs> is that Norway race on that? uh caliber uh yeah norway would be there for sure Super you know one of my teammates there. uh won a won a race one won a stage there um okay. but i've like 
a lot of the races that we've been doing, the bread and butter races have been these sort of like one day French races, French cup races. Okay. Um, and I've had like two second places there, second place at this other like sort of gravelly bat and kill style race in the Netherlands. Um, uh, so I've come quite close, but <laughs> haven't, haven't yet been able to seal the deal. So I think that's definitely still, still a goal for sure. And those have all come from, uh, being in some sort of breakaway, like the early break or, or the late, late, late breakaway, um, something like that. So I think it's still possible, uh, still definitely. working, it, still striving. Um, Dude, yeah. Don't give up on that. I think it's, no, no, for sure. It's incredible too for people that haven't like even if you just Google Robin's name and look at the pro what is it pro cycling stats or whatever just to look through the races that you've done I mean I, I I'm it's cool to hear you say how appreciative you are and how much you love the fact that you're like well I'm making a living doing this because you look at where you've gone through the world who you've gotten to race against I mean it is uh, whether it's world tour or not being a pro conti race you're in some phenomenal races and sure, yeah I've definitely gotten to like yeah being a lot of big races a lot of a lot of cool stuff um being in the the break at flesh Vallon two years ago was was pretty special got to ride up the the murder we uh twice off the front um That's crazy. Insane, but, uh, yeah that definitely it was definitely something super special but i think yeah it would be nice to get back to be able to do something like that um this year and the coming years for sure you talk about having a brain and you were always very adamant about finishing school and doing well in school. And if you weren't a bike racer, what, what do you think you might be doing right now with yeah. that brain? Cause you're definitely <laughs> cranial, <laughs> no clue. What do you like to do outside of bike racing? Ah, I mean, oh, you make bread. That's true. Yeah, it's true. I do love cooking. Um, got into the whole like uh, bread baking sourdough thing a few years ago. Um, and that kind of that kind of blew up on online for sure. Um, <laughs> COVID, everybody's making bread. It's like oh yeah, yeah. I can't tell you how many people have asked asked for advice in the last last eight months on on sourdough. Um, but yeah, I don't. Kind of going back to like how I wasn't really that like insane junior talent. Everybody in my family is academics. There's so many of them, and everybody there's mm -hmm. so many PhDs in my extended family, and so mm -hmm. it was just obvious and natural that I was going to go to college um never even thought twice about it like was going to go to the best school I could get into um yeah like by the, when I was applying to colleges I what you're like 17 maybe mm -hmm. uh, um probably racing age 17 so I wasn't even in like the the higher junior category and I didn't know I, yeah phew, I was nothing at that point like really not not on the radar for doing anything <laughs> special in in athletics so i was just going to go to school and then it kind of accelerated from there over the course of a few years um and found myself all of a sudden having to train to be a pro cyclist in the middle of like a super high powered like academic college uh and i got through it but it wasn't um <laughs> yeah get towards the end of college it was just about like trying to finish up while maintaining um and trying not to get sick all the time uh <laughs> but yeah i have no idea what i'd be doing i have a degree in economics um just a bachelor's uh really no clue <laughs> yeah no it's hard to it's hard to comment on that i mean it's yeah it's, uh i went into medical devices if somebody asked me what i would be doing if i was a cyclist instead i wouldn't have said selling medical devices so it's really impossible to predict, but what's the, uh, what do you think is a race where you learn the most in and maybe why was that? Was there some, you know, sort of like Carlos had told you, okay, wait five minutes. So you do that and you kind of pick up on that. Is there anything that you had like pivotal moments and maybe it was when you were stepping up into the pro ranks or even through bike rides, just racing on a really strong team coming from a background where you're like, I was, I was a junior and I was just, joey bike rider i wasn't anything special what kind of anything that stands out in your memory hmm. it's funny i don't really think about bike ridge very often these days anymore but that is kind of like the thread that connects us um, that is a thread yeah dude i don't think i was thinking I was like when was the last time i talked to robin besides just like an online yo what yeah, up or occasionally on, yeah yeah <laughs> but i haven't seen you in it's been a long it, dude it might have been tour cat skills I mean, yeah, I mean that's going on. That's going on ten years. It's a long time, yeah. Uh, but 
yeah, being on Bike Ridge was this point. It was, yeah, just such a, such a good year of figuring that stuff out. Like Steve Weller was the mm -hmm. team captain mm -hmm. and totally selfless guy who was just, you know, wanted to guide everybody around. Um, but that was a team where everybody just sort of was just like trading attacks. Everybody sort of sharing the load. People, almost everybody could be where they needed to be in that race to any given race to, to influence it. And it was like, okay, well, you went and then he came back. All right, then this guy's going, he comes back. And there was never like, never anybody holding back for themselves. Um, there was like, yeah, Catskills was like one of the only races I can remember where we actually like set up for like one or two specific guys and did like a lead out into the bottom of uh, Devil's Kitchen. Devil's Kitchen yeah. Uh, yeah, for for Alistair and, and Pete. Um, but yeah, being on that team and sort of watching that, being a part of that sort of flow of teamwork and operating as a unit was super enlightening, I think, from the beginning. Um, but I'm trying to think about like, there was one, yeah, the tour of Utah in 2014, I was, it was like the first time I had like, I got into the, like the EB, uh, the early break on stage one. And Do people like, call it that, the EB? What? The, sorry, I just scared you. Do people call it the EB? I've never heard that, I love it. Yeah, 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 I don't know. I mean, that might just be like, a, could be a Canadian thing too. I've had so many Canadian teammates the last few years. They might sorry to get EB. so excited and like blow your drums out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. All right, uh, uh, EB. Yeah, they're getting to the, the EB. Um, but yeah, that was like, got there and then it was like, we went up this huge climb up to Brian Head, which ordinarily I'd be absolutely terrified of. Um, but went up the climb and then I, you know, the, the KOM line was on like a flatter section near the top and I had like a pretty good kick from like a, a slow start. Um, and I, I got the KOM. Yeah, it flattened out. Um, towards the, like the, you know, where they put KOM lines in some of these, these hills can be kind of random. Um, and usually it's probably towards the, the very tippy top where it's a little bit flatter, which is actually good for someone like me. I've got a pretty good kick from like a slow start. Um, and I maxed out KOM points on that and like another point in the stage. And I was, you know, it was the first time I'd ever been in like a, like a leader's jersey at one of these big you know, American races when they when they used to be when they used to be a few of them, <laughs> you know, Cali, Utah, Colorado, Alberta, that kind of stuff. Um, and it, all of a sudden, it was like, oh well, maybe I could like hold on to this jersey for a while. And so that week was just this like big revelation that I could actually maybe do something in these races and not just mm -hmm. hang on for dear life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that changed, changed things around a lot for me in the next couple of years, uh, like just confidence wise, um, you get one, one small result out of that, like just, just making it into the early break on day one, it just changed my mindset on what was possible in these races. It's like, ah, oh, it wasn't that hard. Like, yeah, wasn't that crazy. Like I didn't do anything insane to like get here. I wasn't on some like binge diet where I lost 10 pounds or, you know, something so there wasn't anything like that changed a lot. It was just, uh, just a breakout result and it changed how I thought about my approach to these bike races. Dude, this has been awesome. You've dropped a lot of really good knowledge. I think we're coming up an hour, so I want to let you go. I have one last question and I think, correct me if I'm wrong. So kind of when we're boiling things down, you know, you've talked a lot about definitely mindset the way, you know, and not overthinking things, but having consistency in your training, putting in the work, you know, not needing to obsess over doing 50 super hard interval sessions in a month. Um, if you were like teaching a cycling class or you had someone's like, Hey, I need some tips and coaching. What's just a couple things that you would leave people with um, kind of like your parting words that, somebody could take forward in their training and it can just be something repeated that you've said, but that you want a point that you want to drive home to people. Um, I, I just think you've shared so much that is so like, I'm, it helps to reaffirm things to someone like me that's training for amateur events. Mm -hmm. um, 
but really like I always think back to when I first started you hear something and there's so many things that you hear that it's like I got to do all these things what yeah. are what are like the standout things that you think just that people simple things that people can take and like improve upon as a cyclist doesn't even have to be a bike race or just getting a little bit better because it sounds like that's sort of what it is like all these little steps that you know you take a little step you make a leap take a little step make a leap and what's kind of your parting words for everybody hmm yeah i would say that i mean i think there, someone's someone's obviously said it better uh, at some point what's uh, about like riding more or whatever um but consistency is key and it doesn't mean like you have to ride like a lot more all the time but like mm -hmm. even if you can't ride for you know you can't you can't get the workout in that you wanted to do but you just want to just get something in um you're gonna it's gonna make you feel better the next day it's gonna slowly add up um sorry there's a cat here who's trying to get in the way <laughs> what's up little <laughs> kitty <laughs> hey um yeah, consistency is key, but in order to be consistent, you have to you have to want to do it. Um, and so, preparing yourself and setting yourself up to to have fun while you're doing whatever you're doing is really important because it's going to make it a thousand times easier to get out and do what you need to do each day. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the the easiest way to to make gains is just to not go not go too hard that one day you don't need to do that extra interval um make it so that you're enjoying yourself um and that you can just be there consistently and it's not just this huge like up and down roller coaster it's awesome that you say that because i was actually yes was it yesterday yeah, today's monday i was like finishing my ride and doing some muscular endurance stuff at the end and like the endorphins are going i'm like i should do another i should do two more of these and i was like dude you don't have to go home wrecked like it's okay oh, yeah to go home and be ready to recover so you can go again on Tuesday. And you really see, yeah. you always struck me as someone that enjoys the process of all of this rather than just the, um, you seem to be somebody that enjoys the training aspect, like just riding. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, I'd say so. I definitely enjoy the training um, and I don't try to like overcomplicate it too much. Yeah. Um, like going finding cool routes and doing some new stuff and stringing together some like connections that maybe it was unusual or haven't done before. Uh, but just, yeah, about those like extra intervals, like this last week, I just finished off like a, you know, a three week build, um, uh, did about 28 hours this week or last week, I guess. And like 26 before that and 20 before that. Um, so I was pretty, I was pretty smoked by the end of yesterday and I had done like kind of like randomly extra hours during the week. So I was on the last day and I was kind of like ahead of schedule and I was, you know, you always catch yourself thinking, well, what if I just like did, you know, did a little more and I'll just meet this like random benchmark that I said, Oh, what if I hit like 30 hours this week? That'll be cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, it's like that weird cycling, weird, weird pieces of cycling where it's like, it's got this like bizarre prestige. Like, yeah, I did 30 hours this week. I'm so yeah. cool. Um, but, I, and I, but I was super smoked at the start of the ride yesterday. I was doing like a gravel ride with a couple of friends that it's been pretty consistent. Um, and the route was a little bit shorter. So we were finishing up only about like four and a half hours when I'd originally like scheduled six. Um, and I was kind of wondering if I should like, you know, get back to parking lot, like maybe do some extra credit, go back up this hill a couple of times. And just like, you know what? I've seen what happens to myself when I've like overdone it on these big training blocks and I've seen how tired I can get. And like, I it's, it's January 10th or whatever, you know, yeah. <laughs> there's no yeah. need to do that extra random bit. It doesn't, it's almost meaningless to just be trying to like hit some arbitrary number. Um, I've made my goal for the week and it's time to shut it down. Even if that day was like shorter than maybe what I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah. And that's to save that like match. That's to save that little like that little piece of motivation for for later on down the road. Amen to that. I lied. So I have one more question. What was that three weeks consisting of? Is it mostly base stuff still for you? Are you do are you still doing like the mostly tempo sweet spot and then occasionally yeah. after it before the races start? And would you start those micro? Yeah, I do like six to eight weeks. Yeah, I do a lot of. Um, I would say that like my my zone two rides are probably somewhat harder than most, you know, the whole like pedaling thing, pedaling on the downhills, mm -hmm. um, and trying to maintain that like, like upper end of zone two power. Uh, Do you target a percentage of like FTP? Just, 
Uh, yeah, usually like norm, like the what's the IF is aiming for like about 0.65, um, okay. which is actually more difficult than you might think in Southern California because there's so many damn lights and stop signs and stuff um, that it's actually like somewhat annoying to get a consistent average. You got to pick your routes carefully. Um, okay. but yeah, I'm generally aiming for like 0.65 on, on my endurance rides for percentage of FTP. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I mean, to try to keep it fresh a little bit over the last, uh, few weeks, I have like, instead of saying I need to do like four by 12 minutes or something like that, I try to just pick out segments so you can like have a little bit of extra mm -hmm. motivation. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, not everybody's a Strava, Strava nerd or <laughs> like cares about that kind of thing, but it definitely helps me to like, you know, keep on the gas a little bit if I'm like, oh yeah, I know, like I want to see like a benchmark time here or like see how that compares. Uh, and so I've done a lot more like sweet spot on just any given climb that I know there's a segment on instead of uh, sort of any prescribed regimen. Um, and that's not always the case. Like that's kind of a, a lack of racing uh, pandemic yeah. <laughs> style of yeah. doing things these days. Um, not always going to be that way, but yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of sweet spot. Um, yeah. Like you said, go hard twice a week for the most part. And the rest of it's just zone two. I've been on like a, in order to ride with my friends who are like actually have jobs these days, I switched my schedule around to uh, like Mondays and Fridays easy. And then you get the weekend to ride with your, ride with your homies um, and get the work in like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So cool. yeah, that's been the schedule. Do you lift at all? Uh, no, I've done it in the past, like winters, like probably once every other winter. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> like, that's a that that's definitely a weak spot for me in terms of using your brain. I always get into the gym and I'm like having a great time and like progressively doing like progressive overloads. Um, and I always hurt myself. Always, mm. <laughs> I've never done, I've never yeah. done like off season cross training and not hurt myself. I've even I've done I've had winters where I'm like I'm promising myself like look you're not going to run hard. You're going to take it easy. You're just doing this to like mix it up and to be healthy. And then I swear to God, I don't know if I'm fragile or <laughs> if I'm just that much of a nut job that I always, always put myself. Like even uh, last year I was in the gym doing like squats and deadlifts, like trying to do like, you know, basic lifts, um, mm -hmm. stuff that's just like really healthy and good for like your full body. And I was thought I was taking it easy on the squats, like not doing too much of an overload. And then I was just down at the bottom of the squat and then ping, like something went in my back and I had oh. like a strained back for like three weeks. And I was Oof. like, man, yeah, I just can't, I can't put myself here. <laughs> but Stay I think away. it is generally good, especially if you can, if you can moderate yourself and not get too ego driven. Um, it can be really helpful uh, for like durability yeah Apparently that's, not. that's a camp i'm in to be <laughs> much older i'm like i need to do this for human health as opposed to bike yeah, racing but, uh, i think it's really good especially if you don't have the ability to just ride outside in good weather like i do all the time mm -hmm. it's really easy for me to just go out and bust out 20 hours on, mm -hmm. on, on the bike each week outside no problem but if you're in a place with like much worse weather um especially yeah it's january you know most people are in a place with terrible weather right now yeah lifting can be really good um and really help you maintain without like driving yourself crazy riding the trainer or freezing your your hands off outside good choice of words dude thank you robin I greatly no appreciate problem. you doing this who, who, who's uh who's somebody else that you would recommend that might be that has good insights and i'm not going to put you on the spot and be like he told me that you would do this but <laughs> uh, uh good question i think um Think about it. Get back. You would have you'd have probably a lot of fun interviewing one of my teammates, Kyle Murphy. He's a. Uh, he's. I don't from, know if you know Kyle. He's from New he's, York, right? Uh, man, I don't even know where he's technically from these days. He's lived in New York. He was a bike yeah. messenger. He's lived in Evans' like, his brother. Yeah, yeah. We both yeah. knew Evan quite well before. before okay. Kyle. Kyle is a. Uh, he lives in Vermont now. Um, Burr. So he's like, I, he's just a, he's someone who'd probably get a lot of like 
wackadoo answers out of um i like he that have, he's a he's a character super talented super nice and total weirdo uh <laughs> cool awesome yeah. Yeah. Hey, man. Thank you very much. I'll post this uh, probably sometime next week and keep yeah, give me a heads up so I can uh, send it to my PR guy. For sure. I will. And thanks again. And well, I'll talk to you soon and keep up uh, watching your big results. It's awesome to see, dude. Super motivating and inspiring to all of us. So good luck this year. Hopefully racing happens. Yeah. Likewise to you and uh, stay healthy out there. Thanks, Robin. See you later, man. Later. Bye.